would best achieve those ends. We need to experiment. And this is especially true in the context of technological change, in the context of rapid technological change. We live in a world right now where the future is radically uncertain. The way to deal with uncertainty is diverse experimentation. We can't reason out the answers to the best forms of post-singularity social organization a priori, like sitting around some table at this conference. We have to have a bunch of societies that are experimenting with the best social rules to deal with emerging technology. Although I shouldn't be too like ridiculously optimistic because we don't want to experiment with emerging technology in a way that will let um, some emerging technology kill us all. So it's important to have global safeguards against us all getting killed. But to the extent that emerging technology only has local effects, the best way to find out what works is by experimenting locally. Reality is the ultimate arbiter of truth. Let's let it figure out what works rather than trying to determine it ahead of time. When you get into this viewpoint, you end up seeing a lot of political debate as a childish tug of war, like people pulling on a rope. We want to pull sideways on the rope. Not argue about what everyone should do, but argue that everyone should get to try different things and we'll see what actually works. If you're into space, fundament then firmament. Space has the same quality as the ocean, that you can move very large things around very cheaply. So if this theory is right, we'll also get good government in space. We've built our civilization in the wrong place right now on this like static, mucky land, but most of the planet and most of the universe has the characteristics for a dynamic society. Few. This is a very weird political idea because it's not based on rhetoric. It's not based on like, let's get the right leaders in power. Let's convince people. It says, let's invent the technology to live on the ocean and government will change. This should sound familiar to people who are into transhumanism. This is a picture of one of my transhuman enhancements, LASIK. Technology just makes things change without you ever having to convince anyone by changing the incentives. All right, this is a short talk, so I hope I've gotten you excited about this general idea, and I'm just gonna whiz through a few of the things that the Seasteading Institute is actually doing to make this happen. Uh, we founded a 501c3 nonprofit last year with 500K from Peter Thiel. We're working on engineering. This is designed for a 200-guest hotel resort uh, off LA, San Diego. This may be interesting to people here. So we're working on the business of medical tourism on cruise ships. That is, people complain about the FDA. Well, 12 miles off the coast, there is no FDA. So we're, we're looking at plastic surgery initially, um, cosmetic procedures, the idea that you, know, you might go to the ocean and come back looking, looking prettier, and hey, it, it was something in the water. Um, <laughs> But for future radical life enhancement technologies, this could be a good way to get around regulation. We did a design contest. Here are some of the pretty pictures of the winners. These were based on real engineering skeletons, where then the buildings were imagined by artists. I wrote a book. It's free online. Just search for Seasteading Book. It's very detailed and technical. I'm writing a new book, which will be done in a few months for a wider audience. We had a conference um, in the Bay Area a couple months ago. 20 speakers, our second annual conference, talked about engineering, business law, philosophy, architecture. Ephemeral, we recently held our first ever floating festival on the San Joaquin River near Stockton. <laughs> Woo! Unlike most of our activities, it actually involved getting wet and fully engaging with the realities of life on the water. Um, I personally began the event by capsizing my home-built pirate raft, <laughs> pictured here, shortly before it's capsized. Uh, eventually, I got bored at how slow it was going, and I tried to climb up the side, and um, yeah, it capsized. Fortunately, I had a, a, um, a phone and a waterproof bag, thanks to Matt Bell, and people were keeping tabs on me, thanks to Chris Peterson, so I was quickly rescued. <laughs> After that, really nothing, nothing bad can happen. This is a picture of our main platform. Here's how it looked at night, and the big thing that we're working on right now is our strategy for the next five to six years. Uh, to create the world's first actual independent seastead out there, real and experimenting by 2015. We're finishing out the strategy right now. We're going to be fundraising for it next year. So if you're interested in dreaming of a better world and trying to get there, check us out. Thanks, Patri. That's really amazing. We've got time for a couple questions. Yes? Um, does anyone have some questions for Patri?
being told to repeat the question for a webcast. Uh, so I said, cities have network externalities because of who lives near you, and then you get lock-in. Doesn't that apply to boats too? Yes, it is true that cities have network externalities and they get lock-in. Uh, in addition to network externalities, there may be specific large pieces of infrastructure which Seastead cities need to build that also give you lock-in. Um, however, it, it remains the case that there can still be competition among multiple large Seastead cities, so you get greater competition than on land. There's also the fact that, that, as they say in chess, the threat is greater than the execution. So if everybody in a large Seastead city threatens to go leave, you can get a change in the operating government of that entire Seastead city. Uh, if it's operated as a for-profit corporation, for example, you know, are you going to vote in the board of directors that all of the people living in the city have said, oh, they're doing things so that we'll stay? Or are you going to vote as a shareholder to keep the old board of directors where everyone in the city has said, you know, we're going to go even if we have to build our own. So that threat of exit can still give you competition. Um, and these issues lower the amount of, of competition from the sort of ideal where you can always switch, but you still have a lot more competition than we have now. Thank you. We have time for one more quick question in the back. Yeah, I, I don't in any way mean to associate you with this group, but I believe it is factually true that um, the Scientologists tried something like this with Sea Org. Could you, I assume you've looked into that? I'm, yes. I'm just curious what your, what your understanding Yeah, the, the bad that. guys are already doing this. Shouldn't the good guys do it too? <laughs> Thank you, Patri. Well, one of the things that I find interesting about Patri's work is that um, it really highlights how dependent uh, humans are on objects uh, and, uh, and how those objects define what we can do. And our next speakers, um, uh, Brian Bishop and, B and Ben Lipkowitz uh, are working on uh, a new framework for um, designing and building objects. Thanks, Todd. All right, so that was a great talk. I really like that. I like the Seed Study Institute. That's great work. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how to make a civilization seed and downloading hardware over the web. And when, when I say downloading hardware over the web, I'm talking about uh, literally I want a car, make it show up in front of me, and uh, and make that happen. Where should I be pointing? Where should I be pointing this? There we go. Thanks. All right. So the idea is that uh, if you have all these modular units, like in the seasteading instance. Uh, eventually, we want to have a civilization seed to take it to another planet, maybe. Um, so you see here, going from Earth to uh, another planet. And if we can do it once, then we can do it multiple times, and we can do it as much as we want. Um, and this allows for as much development and diversity as you want. So society is going from analog to more digital. And if you're here and you don't believe that, I, I don't know why you're here then. Um, so you could say that there's kind of a DNA of civilization that's emerging. Um, you could say that objects make up uh, the artifacts and culture and so on. So uh, Neil Gershenfeld once said that uh, it's here we won, we already won the digital revolution, so we don't have to have it again, and we don't have to keep on having it. But uh, you see, his background is that he's made these things called fab labs out of MIT, it's a media lab, and they all use proprietary technology to build uh, as much manufacturing equipment as possible in a small space. And I believe Todd set one up in Afghanistan, which was awesome. Um, so you really can't do that because of patents, copyright, and data jails. You just do that um, unless you have a lot of money. So you have to reinvent wheels and lots of wheels. And if you're reinventing everyone's wheels, you can't get much stuff done. And you can also be shot. So there has to be an alternative to this. Um, and there is. They've been working on that in the software world. Uh, it's called Debian. Um, there's a huge history of uh, free software, starting with Richard Stallman in the 1980s. And it went on with Linux and other events. And what the Debian people did is they started to shift the burden of software away from users having to install software and made their computers install software for them to figure out all the details and technicalities. And the way they did that is by making something called a package. And the package is what is the unit of Debian so that you can install software and it takes care of all the peculiarities for you. It's all free software, all open source, and you can go home and download it if you want. So about Debian, um, 
there are certain cost models, methods of estimating how much software is worth or how much value was put into it. And in the case of Debian, it was about $13 billion. And that's not including all the resulting development work that has gone into it, such as people that use it on a daily basis. Um, so as I said, it's all completely free and open source software. Um, there's a social contract to maintain integrity of vision. And um, the burden was shifted from end users to maintainers, a core group of people who uh, are dedicated to this. And also it's flown on the space shuttle a few times, which I think is awesome, the uh, ideals of America and freedom. So these are just some of the points that the Debian project makes up. They talk about how freedom and uh, distribution restrictions and so on don't apply to them, or freedom does, but distribution restrictions don't, and so on. So to a lot of people who uh, are into intellectual property, this makes no sense because this is impossible in other parts of the world, but on the internet, this has been made possible. So there was a study in 2003 that looked over this project, and they showed, uh, look, how many packages we have. And it went all the way up to 10,000 in 2002. And uh, they just started off with just a few, with about 2,000. Oh, I'm sorry, that, that's wrong, uh, zero, because you have to start somewhere. And then you move up to about 10,000. Um, and again, this is the number of people involved in the project. And between like 1997 and 1998, um, the number of people doubled that were involved in this project. It started in 94. Um, and then in the paper that I got these diagrams from, they projected that there's going to be 100,000 packages of software, free software, that anyone can have by 2006. N no, <laughs> that didn't happen. But the curves were a bit off, but I still think it was a good job. So this was a picture of what was on my computer. I run Debian, and this is a network graph of all the different software packages installed. And the big ones are uh, hard drive space. And then you can also see uh, to the left of the bottom of the red box, there's a lot of connectivity. That means that the software is highly interconnected to each other. And it's also becoming a lot easier because of Ubuntu. Um, Mark Shuttleworth has put in a lot of money with Canonical and his company. And you can literally go download a CD of Ubuntu and install it. And when you're done with it, you can turn off your computer again and you're back to normal. So you should try it out. So I think the real value of Debian is severely underestimated because there's $13 billion of work from free volunteers. <laughs> so in the world of objects, and when you're trying to do a civilization seed or you're trying to make things, uh, you have to do a lot of crap that doesn't really matter in the end. Uh, and there's no way to get around that right now. So what if we do this, where we shift all the burden to maintainers instead of individual makers? And this is uh, another XKCD cartoon. We already had one today. but. But I think this one's better because the idea is that I don't want to have to make my own sandwich. I want you to make it for me. Or not really you, but a computer or a machine. So the idea is downloading hardware from the web. Um, we shift the burden from, from uh, users to maintainers. We have policies, formats, package metadata, hardware dependencies. That means in order to make a car, you need a lathe. And to make a lathe, you need metal, and so on and so forth. And so this is all in a computer format. We're developing this software. It's called SKDB. You can download it for free. It's also open source hardware. Um, and it's all based on physical units that you can measure. And the main method of this is called app git. This is a more technicality. But the idea is that a user shouldn't have to think about how they make stuff. They should be thinking about what they're making. And we have a bit of an app store we've been developing. The website isn't released yet, but you can buy hardware by clicking make. And then instructions are printed out for you on how to make the thing that you want, such as a wearable. Or maybe uh, you want a laser cannon to take over the world, a robot army, perhaps. And uh, Ben has a few words on uh, the culture around this. So I'm going to talk about what's already existing uh, today. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. Debian, when they started, they had zero packages. But that didn't mean there wasn't any free software existing. There were tons of. Uh, programs al already, what Debian did was they put it in uh, a well-defined format so that it was easy to use. And similarly, today, there's a lot of open source hardware already out there, but we just have to package it up. Um, so starting off, this is a 4 byte panel CNC router. It's uh, made entirely out of structural steel, and you can put one together for a couple thousand dollars, which is a lot better than paying $30,000 to buy one. Uh, this is a vertical machining center. You can make molds for injection molded plastic or space shuttle parts or anything. Um, the multi-machine is made out of 
junk engine parts. And so you don't actually have to have any precision machine tools to make this. You can bootstrap 